Assalamu alaikum. In this video, we'll be looking at some of the clinical conditions that affect the thyroid. The scenario is a woman presents with these signs and symptoms. The symptoms being feeling very tired during the day, feeling a lack of hunger, cold intolerance, and gain in weight. And on examination, you notice that there is a lump in front of her neck. And when you palpate the lump, it is normally diffuse, but at certain points, you may notice certain nodular type outgrowths. And furthermore, on examination, you may notice that the area is hot and tender. On investigations, we pick up that the levels of T3 and T4 are low, while that of TSH is high. This is a characteristic uh, scenario of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, you must understand that this thing happens in phases. The first phase, basically, is the autoimmune attack of the thyroid. This whole disease is actually an autoimmune disease where the body is attacking the thyroid gland. And normally, from up here, this is what they're showing is the pituitary. Now, the pituitary is the one responsible for making the thyroid stimulating hormone. You can see the adenohypophysis here and the neurohypophysis on the back side. It is the adenohypophysis which releases the thyroid stimulating hormone. And these travel down below to the thyroid gland. This, these dots you're seeing here are actually TSH and they're stimulating the thyroid to produce T3, T4. And this all works on a negative feedback. If there is a high concentration of T3, T4, TSH would be suppressed. A low concentration would cause an increase in TSH. And we're seeing right now a lot of the TSH being secreted. Why? Because there's a lack of T3, T4. And that is because the thyroid is damaged due to the autoimmune attack. And normally it's not this large. Here you can see a very enlarged thyroid and the term we use is goiter. And the lump, characteristic lump of the neck is also visible. So there are many theories of how this happens. A lack of iodine, uh, inflammatory reaction. When it comes to autoimmune diseases, it's still an ongoing area with a lot of gray areas and things that we need to learn. A lot of enigmas in this. But when it does happen, initially there'll be swelling and a transitory period of hyperthyroidism, but ultimately due to the damage and fibrosis, there is hypothyroidism. And then those signs and symptoms appear. Now, to illustrate it further, what you are seeing is a group of follicles and the colloid material within those follicles. These are the cuboidal to columnar shaped cells of the thyroid follicles. And you can see there are multiple of them. If I were to give you a bird's eye view, you can see how a thyroid gland is composed of multiple follicles, cuboidal shape, and they're columnar when they're actively secreting. And this is all the colloid material, which contains your T3, T4. In Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you have infiltration of these lymphocytes, white blood cells, which then release these antibodies. They're mostly the B cells, which release the antibodies, and the T cells, they directly attack these uh, other structures. So as these lymphocytic infiltrate enter into the thyroid, they release these antibodies, and the antibodies then clump against these cells, damaging them. Ultimately, you have the fibrosis and shrinkage. Initially, due to the inflammatory reaction, there is enlargement, goiter, but ultimately, everything inside is damaged. And that is the reason why there is a lack of secretion of T3, T4. So this is what's happening microscopically. Now, unlike Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which causes goiter and consequently hypothyroidism, cancer of the thyroid can be of several different forms. The most common is called papillary carcinoma, or the second one is follicular. And uh, in this case, the entirety of the thyroid won't be enlarged, but there will be growth of certain nodules within the thyroid and these are easily picked up not only on examination but also on radiography. Certain of these nodules can be hot or cold. Hot would mean that they're actively picking up the radioactive iodine and cold meaningly they're not picking up. This is one way to determine if there are any sort of 
neoplasms occurring within the thyroid. So if you were to stage them, a stage one would just be a single solitary nodule. And uh, so long it is not spread, there's no metastasis, this can easily be corrected with surgery. And this is the best time to do surgery. Uh, both papillary and follicular carcinoma, if you want to talk about prognosis, papillary has a good prognosis with the surgical resection and obviously a lifelong uh, uh, supply of uh, the thyroxine which the patient has to take. Of course, if it's only involving one lobe and only one lobe is affected, then the other lobe can compensate. There won't be any need to take thyroxine. But this depends once again on the staging. A stage 2 tumor, however, would be a thyroid nodule which is quite enlarged. And this is actually pretty appreciable on the neck then. There can also be multiple nodules in that case. Stage 3, this is where the mets start happening and the mesostasis actually involves the lymph nodes. You can see here, the pretracheal lymph nodes right over here are involved. If you remember the nodes that we did, we had the pretracheal, the paratracheal, and over above we had the prelaryngeal. So once the nodes are involved, it's important to resect these as well because from here on, it's just all the way downhill. The worst case scenario would be when there is hematogenous spread, when that same tumor passes through the blood through these vessels then it becomes really difficult to treat although you can remove the origin the source material the spread can actually go as far as till the brain certain patients with the um, thyroid cancer they've been known to show mets which actually involve the brain and others here they have not shown that but it's important to realize that mets can spread anywhere through the blood wherever the blood vessels reach the cancer can reach there here we have a thyroid scan, which is basically, in a way, it's an ultrasound of the thyroid, but after intake of radioactive iodine. Now, that iodine, once taken up, will then enter and diffuse throughout the thyroid. Those areas which are very active in the uptake, which are basically, um, in this case, however, this is actually grave disease where there's hyperthyroidism, but it can also happen in the initial phases of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So those areas, the follicles which are highly active in uptake, they will become darker on the thyroid scan. We call these the hot nodules. While the ones which are pretty blank, not active, are cold nodules and you can't really see them, appreciate them here well. Otherwise, you can see that the whole thyroid is actually involved. It has almost heterogeneously taken up the iodine and uh, this shows that the entire thyroid is involved and you have a goiter here. And here we have a sagittal section, CT scan sagittal section. And you will notice how that the thyroid gland here is severely enlarged. In fact, it's so enlarged that it's actually compressing the trachea on the backside and the uh, esophagus. This enlarged thyroid can actually cause dysphagia, difficulty in swallowing, and worst case scenario, dyspnea, a difficulty in breathing. And you can see here, here's the mandible, the tongue, and the thyroid right below this. Here is the vertebra and the spinal column. And as we go further to the side, you see that the entirety of the thyroid is quite enlarged. To finish off, what I want to show you is a histological slide of a papillary carcinoma of the thyroid. Now you can see the follicles here, how they are uh, the entire arrangement is messed up. But uh, what is characteristic about papillary carcinoma are these large nuclei, which are very, very pale. These are your characteristic uh, orphan any eye nucleuses within the papillary carcinoma. It is a characteristic finding in papillary carcinoma. And uh, there's also other things like some mama bodies, but you won't find these in follicular carcinoma. And by the way, the titular name orphan any is actually a comic book character from the early 40s and 50s and you can look that up and why did they call them orphan Annie eyes because you know she had the drawing of orphan Annie was simply that she had white pale eyes and it was just a, uh, the drawing style actually but they compared that to this and that's why you have the orphan Annie eyes in papillary carcinoma.